So when you start to think about atoms, one of the things that you should ask yourself is how, how is it that we know all that we know about atoms, things you can't even see? They're too small to be seen, and yet we know all this stuff about them. So, so where does that come from? Well, this is a little history lesson. We need to go back, we need to go way back, uh, 500 years BCE, to India uh, and to a Hindu sage and philosopher named Kanada. And Kanada was the founder of the Vaisheksha school of philosophy. Uh, this was a school of philosophy that dealt with uh, matter and its composition. And Kanada, among others, uh, were the first, he was the first to actually write down about these things called Anu, which are what we now know to be atoms. He believed that uh, these Anu were an indestructible particle that all matter was made of. And specifically, uh, the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, uh, and then ether as well. Ether was a special element that was only possessed or only composed um, humans because we were the, the highest order living thing. But everything was composed of air, earth, fire, and water. And those four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, were made up of these tiny little particles called Anu. It didn't really get out of India very much uh, till much, much later on. Um, and usually Canada is uh, not given credit. It, the credit for the first use of the word Adam or reference to Adam is given to Democritus. Uh, Democritus came from a part of Thrace, which is, in, uh, is now part of Greece, called Abdera. Democritus was a philosopher, and he was one of the atomists. Uh, he and his teacher, Leucippus, were the principals in this philosophical group called the Atomists. And they believed that atomos, which is Greek for uncuttable, atomos was the term that they used uh, for particles that made up all matter. Uncuttable is what atomos means. And so, essentially, Democritus was saying the same thing as Canada. Um, this is where we get our word atoms from, from the Greek word for uncuttable. And... The, the thing about this was that uh, Democritus and, and Canada before him never did any experiments. All of this was largely ignored for a long period of time. Most people stuck with the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, and didn't really think about this atom business. Um, as a matter of fact, it took a while, um, a long while, you know, over, over 2,000 years before uh, an English physicist and chemist, John Dalton, came along and began to do experiments to support this idea of atoms. So Dalton uh, is known for a lot of different things, but we're going to focus primarily on his, his work on the behavior of atmospheric gases. Well, it was this work on gas behavior that led Dalton to basically resurrect the beliefs of the atomists. And he created what is now known as the atomic theory. And it is a fairly modern version of, the, of, of this idea of uncuttable tiny spheres. Dalton's atomic theory has some main principles, and they're very, very important. Most are still held today. Not all of them. Some of them have, have to be modif modified slightly as we uh, were able to discover more about atoms. Uh, the first is that, just like the atomists, Dalton said that all elements... And, and when Dalton did his work in the early 1800s, we knew elements. We knew what elements were that they were the smallest component of matter, that they were made of one kind of particle. Well, Dalton said that all these elements are made of these tiny little particles. They're indivisible, uncuttable again, called atoms. And he used Democritus's word um, as the official name in his publication. Dalton went on further to say that atoms of the same element are identical. So if you have gold, it doesn't matter where you get the gold, all of the gold atoms are exactly the same. But atoms of gold are different from atoms of, say, lead, especially in terms of their mass. Now, this we've modified a little bit recently because we do know that atoms of the same element don't necessarily have to be identical. We'll talk about isotopes later on. Atoms of one element cannot be transformed into atoms of another element by means of a chemical reaction. Dalton essentially put to bed the idea of alchemy, where they tried to convert metals into gold in Europe. Dalton said, nope, can't do it. There is not a chemical reaction that will allow for that. He did qualify that statement by saying, by means of a chemical reaction, 
Dalton, it's believed that Dalton may have thought there was a way to turn out atoms of one element into another, but it, it wasn't going to be done by chemistry. And in fact, we now know it's not done by chemistry. It's done by nuclear physics, where you can actually smash nuclei of particles together and get to make bigger atoms. That's how some of the elements on the periodic table uh, towards the bottom were made. Atoms of one element can combine with atoms of another element in simple whole number ratios. So atoms go together in simple whole number ratios to make compounds. And finally, in chemical reactions, atoms are joined, separated, or rearranged. And that's really all that a chemical reaction is. It's either putting atoms together, pulling them apart, or just rearranging their order. That's, that's it. There's nothing else that happens in chemical reactions. So Dalton's atomic theory now made popular this concept of these tiny little particles, these atoms. And once that became sort of the fashion, other scientists, physicists, and chemists decided to see if they could figure out what it was about these atoms that was so special. Uh, two people who came along, Goldstein and Thompson. Eugen Goldstein in 1886, he was one of the first to believe that atoms weren't in fact uncuttable, that they were made of smaller pieces. And one of the things he was able to do was he was able to discover that atoms actually contain positive charges, which he called protons. Uh, this was a big deal because this sort of proved that atoms, in fact, were made of smaller pieces. Uh, a little bit later on, a few years later in 1897, uh, English physicist J.J. Thompson found that there were equal and opposite charges in atoms. Those were called electrons after this new idea of electricity, uh, which dealt with positive and negative charges. And so electrons were the main contribution of J.J. Thomson. And what happened then was we now began to be able to visualize the atom. See, up until this point, John Dalton's idea of what an atom looked like, it looked sort of like a billiard ball. It was just a round sphere. It had no features. It was just a solid ball. Well, now Thompson said, no, actually, because of these positive and negative charges, uh, the, the atom itself is not a single object. It's made of these tiny little pieces. And he proposed something called the plum pudding model, which was this ball of positive charges in which electrons were sort of stuck, just kind of hanging out there. Uh, and he called it plum pudding because there is a dessert in... Uh, in England called a plum pudding, which was a custard with had little bits of fruit stuck in it. And, and Thompson said, well, that's kind of what an atom looks like. Immediately following that, or within a few years from that, Ernest Rutherford began to do some experiments. And one of the experiments that he did, which was very, very crucial in our understanding of the atom, was the gold foil experiment. Um, from this gold foil experiment, Rutherford deduced the following things. Atoms are mostly empty space. That kind of was known when he went into this experiment. As a matter of fact, that was one of the reasons he performed it. He wanted to prove that atoms are mostly made of empty space. We'll talk about how he did that in just a second. But this is one of the things that he was able to prove. But mostly, not entirely empty space, mostly empty space, because there's something in the middle of an atom that Rutherford was able to show, was able to find. He said that this thing in the middle is massive. Most, almost all of the mass of an atom is stuck in the middle, but it's also positively charged and extremely tiny. So yes, atoms are mostly empty space, but there's this tiny little positively charged massive thing in the center. Now massive, remember, doesn't mean size, it means mass. It was actually very small, but very massive. He called this thing a nucleus, which is, from the Latin word for the seed inside a fruit. And if you think of where the seed is, it's right in the middle and it's fairly small. And then you get the rest of the fruit. Well, this is what he envisioned the nucleus was. And in 1908, he won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. The gold foil experiment was very, very important. The way it basically worked was this. Rutherford assumed that atoms were essentially made of empty space. And so what he did was he fired these things called alpha particles. Alpha particles are uh, a little group of two protons and two neutrons stuck together. They're, they're these particles. And he fired these particles at the gold foil, fully expecting the, gold, the particles to go right through the gold. This piece of gold foil, very, very thin, only a few atoms in thickness. And 
if he if these atoms were in fact made of mostly empty space then the these alpha particles would go right through he put a screen around this experiment around the gold foil so that he could watch and see where the particles would hit he can't see alpha particles so he needs to see be able to see where they strike where they where they end up and most of the alpha particles went right through the gold foil and struck the screen immediately on the on the opposite side but every once in a while these alpha particles would bounce off the gold Rutherford's words on this were that it was like taking a 15 inch artillery shell and firing it at a piece of tissue paper and having it bounce off the tissue paper and come back that's how surprising this was to him well the fact that alpha particles which are made of just protons and neutrons they're positively charged the fact that they were bouncing off occasionally bouncing off the gold foil led to this these deductions that he made uh, in order for them to bounce off the gold foil they would have had to hit something but because most of them didn't bounce off that something they were hitting was very very tiny and because these positively charged alpha particles were bouncing off they were being deflected by the gold foil whatever was in there had to be also positively charged because like charges repel so that was how he was able to figure out that there is something very massive and very positively charged in the center of an atom called uh, now called the nucleus well this allowed uh, Niels Bohr who had worked for Thomson uh, he had worked under Thomson and then he worked with Rutherford in Rutherford's lab uh, to figure out a real good picture of what the atom might look like uh, there were other physicists at the time that were contributing to the behavior of electrons and one of them was Max Planck and Max Planck had this idea that electrons behaved like waves they had a discrete amount of energy uh, and it was called the quantum theory uh, Bohr took some of Planck's ideas about this and put it together with Rutherford's work and developed a picture of the atom that was fairly popular and actually still is it's called the planetary model and he used that description because it was something familiar to him they knew about the solar system that the Sun was in the center and the planets orbited and so Bohr said no well an atom is like that we have this massive nucleus in the middle and then we have these electrons orbiting around like planets around the Sun for this work and now this wasn't just a, an idea like he drew it on a piece of paper he had some ma very very strong math backing him up uh, for hydrogen working on the hydrogen atom uh, he won Nobel Prize in 1922 because of this work now the unfortunate reality of Bohr's work Bohr was brilliant and his ideas were very very close to reality except they didn't work with anything but hydrogen when you started to look at other elements this idea of orbits didn't pan out well fortunately there were a couple of scientists working on that very issue uh, Schrodinger Erwin Schrodinger was the first and primary uh, co uh, participant in this area uh, he and a, a, a scientist by the name of Werner Heisenberg uh, used much more advanced mathematics than Bohr was using Bohr was basically just using like advanced algebra Schrodinger and Heisenberg had to use calculus and in using calculus they were able to figure out that electrons don't actually orbit the nucleus but they sort of exist in clouds and the cloud represents the area where you're likely to find the electron most of the time this birthed a new science called quantum mechanics which is an entire area of physics devoted to understanding the behavior of atoms uh, there are people who spend their entire lives studying quantum mechanics we're just going to touch on it just a little bit in this class the modern atomic model therefore doesn't look like Bohr's planetary model it still has a nucleus but instead of seeing orbits where the electrons travel around the nucleus we see clouds and those clouds are where the electrons live now those clouds are the shapes of those clouds are governed by math and as we understand a little bit more about electrons you'll start to see how that works so there's a lot of information in this video make sure that you watch it a few times rewind and rewatch make sure that you get the names down and their major contributions to our understanding of the atom